Hello, everyone, and welcome to day 54 of Bitwise, where we create a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. We continue with logic design. Um, the last two topics have been sort of, you can call it ALU design, things specific to, um, uh, you know, you want to build an, uh, an adder, a comparator, this sort of thing. Uh, last time we looked at how to make very fast adders, even when the bit width is high, like 64 bits or even higher. Um, today, we will revisit some of that uh, very briefly in light of some improvements uh, and some new analysis tools that I implemented. Um, but then we'll move to sort of what I consider, I guess, for if, if you ignore multipliers and dividers, which arguably are not traditional, considered part of the ALU, they're kind of separate units because they're very specialized and also bigger than, uh, typically bigger than the rest of, of the ALU combined. Uh, but shifters, shifters are really the other half of, of an ALU. There's the bitwise operations, which are trivial. There's the adders, where there's a lot of art. And then the shifters also have um, uh, so, so some tricks that you can apply, and, and I'll show those today. Um, so this is last two things. Maybe I should say ALU design, but um, I'll, I'll continue just putting them under the same rubric. So um, let's... Um, uh, Let's revisit briefly the adder designs from last time. Um, so uh, remember the way we built, we, we, uh, we had two kinds of logarithmic delay adders. We had what's called a conditional sum adder, which from a software perspective is just divide and conquer, where you speculate on the incoming carry, and then you compute both possibilities. And when you know which carry to use, you select between those two speculative outcomes. And you do that recursively all the way down the tree, and you get logarithmic depth. Um, but aside from that, everything else was in the category of carry look-ahead adders where you calculate the carry chain separate, and then once you know that, you can just add it to the uh, to the operand bits uh, with, without doing any carries. So you sort of separate the carry chaining from everything else, uh, and then it turns out that um, the real workhorse becomes a so-called parallel prefix or a scan circuit, and you can plug in different scan circuits, and we saw a bunch of them last time. Uh, naive linear scan, which is not parallel prefix at all, it's just prefix, serial prefix, I guess you can call it. Uh, a naive logarithmic scan where we used our previous log depth uh, binary reduction, but we instantiated one for each output bit. Then Sklansky scan and Brent Kunk scan, which are two ways of um, of doing the same thing, but sharing sub results so you're not wasting a lot of area and fan out. Um, and then one thing that I implemented right after we finished the stream, um, which is called a Coggy Stone uh, circuit. And uh, one way of thinking about it, you can look at this, uh, maybe I'm not probably not going to spend a lot of time explaining it, but basically the idea is that if you look at Brent Kunk scan of the um there's there it starts out with merging even and odd elements and then you recurse on that half length vector um with coggy uh, stone scan even at the very first layer not you, you aren't just adding the even element you, you aren't just adding an odd element to its even predecessor every element is adding itself to its predecessor and then in the layer after that you're adding yourself to the press to your predecessor um at, at, at a greater scale, so at offset one, offset two, offset four, offset eight, uh, and that's what you're doing here. Um, and the benefit of that is, unlike the Brent Kunk scan, you don't have to do another uh, sort of, uh, you know, basically Brent Kunk does first a sort of merge, and then it has to spread out the partial results to the ones that were passed through previously. Here we do every every element is in some sense active all the time. Um, rather than only say the the odd elements being active up here uh, in the first layer. And as a result, it's half, it's, it's half the depth, but there's a lot more activity. There's a lot more area because you're not just passing through the even elements, they're doing stuff. Um, and from a sort of you know electrical power perspective, those are they're consuming power and so on. So um, it's a pretty expensive circuit in that sense, but it's very efficient and it has low fan out, unlike the other log depth circuits we had like Skolansky, Sk which has uh, linear fan out, which is not a good idea in general. So uh, that was just a quick review of that stuff. Uh, but now let's look at it through the lens of this delay, static delay analysis tool I wrote this morning. Um, it's very simple. It's even simpler actually than the one I wrote during the DSL screams uh, because I had time to think about it, how to do it a little bit better. Um, the way it works is you just give it a module and it analyzes all the in output input delays. So for each of the outputs of the module, it gives you the worst case delay to any of the inputs that the output is indirectly connected to. So um, you can you can see it here. This is a simple case. I've already generated the report from a previous run. 
But for adders, we have one output, which is S for the sum. X and Y are two operands uh, that we're adding. And uh, so you can see at the top level, we have a dictionary that's indexed by the output port name. And that in turn gives you an array or a dictionary that's indexed by a uh, by an input port name if the output is indirectly affected by that input. And if, and if it is affected by it, it's the worst case delay to that input. Um, and uh, there's really nothing to it. You, It's a simple, uh, we've seen these a bunch before. You write one of these visitor passes. Um, there's a function for merging delays so that, um, for example, if you have an adder with two inputs and one of the one of the inputs has a large delay and the other one has a small delay, you know, the, uh, the, the final delay of the adder should be, you know, the add propagation delay uh, plus the max of the input delays, basically. So that's the idea. Um, this is not necessarily <laughs> representative very much of, of how real circuits work, where you have to definitely know stuff about layout in order to make good estimates. For example, wires are extremely costly in terms of delay if they get sufficiently long. Uh, also cost a lot of area and stuff like that. Uh, but I chose a very simple model for now that maybe we can expand later. Uh, so I don't want you to take the specific costs too seriously. I picked out these uh, delays for the operators out of textbooks based on uh, uh, logical effort. Uh, the major limitation of the model, even within its own assumptions, is, or even within sort of the toy universe it's trying to model, is that it's not uh, taking into account fan out. So for example, the Skolansky circuit, as you can see here, has the same delay because it's logarithmic depth as a Coggy Stone scan uh, based adder. Um, in reality, the Coggy Stone would be faster because it has a fan out of two, whereas this has a fan out at the last level of 32. Uh, and to do a 32 white, uh, white fan out of a single value, you typically have to use um, probably at least two levels of a fan out tree uh, where you have a, an inverter at each level in order to buffer the fan out uh, to do it efficiently. So uh, th this would be, you know, this would be slower by, I mean, imagine it's like 27 or something like that, uh, probably even more than that. But the, the point is we don't model that right now. I will put in a simple model for that later. So for now, you'll see some of these numbers coincide because we don't model uh, that sort of thing. But uh, what I do want to get across is oh and this is for 64-bit adders by the way um since you, you can start to see the divergence there really significantly so you can see ripple carry this is normalized to the delay of one inverter uh driving no gates so just the intrinsic delay of a single inverter with with no fan out um and so you can see a ripple carry adder with 64 bits uh the way we implemented it at least is very slow it's 200 uh unit delays um but if you look at something like Coggy Stone or any of these uh, faster locked up adders, um, they're very fast, 23. And let me show you, um, if I make n to be 32, uh, how these numbers change. Um, yeah, the algorithms aren't super optimized. It takes a bit to compute. So you can see this this goes in half, basically, as you'd expect, because it's linear depth. So this goes this gets cut in half when you cut in half the bit depth. But this was 23 before, and now it's 20. So, you know, the logarithmic thing is not just some mathematical fantasy. It really does pan out. Um, uh, so you can see this is, you know, like, even if the specific numbers are not accurate, the fact that you're dealing with uh, with this sort of linear delay really means that when you get up to these very wide words, uh, ripple carry is not the best. Even if it's highly optimized at a fine grain, the scalability kind of kills it at that point, I think. Uh, but but all the but this stuff starts to really kick in over say 16 bits. Uh, all these parallel prefix adders. So um, that's it. You can see if I put it down to four, even there, there's a little bit of advantage. Uh, but probably the advantage in something like this would absolutely be killed once you have a real model. Of, of how this would work at a fine grain because you know the ripple carry stuff can be like super optimized and the layout is just kind of everything in a row and so it's very uh, like all the wire delays and all that other stuff uh, and the internal structure of each full adder like all of that stuff can be highly optimized and so the constant factor gains come into play and um, this would for a four bit adder this would win in practice um, but um, anyway just wanted to get that across at least but um, all right. Um, so yeah, that's it for those delays. I'm going to put uh, F back to four for the time being. All right. Um, 
So I said we we're going to cover adders, uh, or sorry, shifters, uh, sort of the other major ALU topic. If, if you don't include um, multipliers and dividers, which are a totally separate topic. Um, so shifters. Um, shifters are, um, of course, I mean, on the one hand, they are a uh, an operation that is supported on you know every CPU. Uh, it has multiple uses you can use it as a fast multiplication or division when you're multiplying or dividing by a power of two um, you can use it for um, sort of a, a you know as a bit buffer type operation where you're uh, which you can think of as in arithmetic terms as well but is more 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 usefully thought of as a bit buffer operation where you're you know it's kind of like a queue where you're stuffing stuff into the queue or shifting it out of the queue so um uh, it's it's a very obviously a very handy operation. So the question is, how do you implement it? Um, well, unlike a lot of the other things we've done so far, it's not really operating on the values of the bits. It's really just routing the bits conditionally, depending on the shift amount. Um, and um, and so um, in a sense, it's just a big mux where uh, where you're selecting. Uh, for each output position, which of the input positions you want to be routed there, and so a lot of uh, a lot of this stuff actually is kind of like desi designing a routing network and figuring out you know how many intermediate stages to, should there be versus not, um, and uh, can you make a more generic circuit that can maybe do multiple routing operations by configuring it, or should you make uh, you know or should you just make completely separate uh, routing circuits for each operation or something like that? So that's kind of how we're going to approach it. Um, all right, so um, so let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, I'm going to just start covering these operations in isolation, and then uh, I'm going to cover how you can kind of like how we tried to unify um, we unified addition, subtraction, and comparison in an ALU that just has a few configurable bits you can kind of control to to have it perform different functions. I'm going to cover that sort of as topic two, but for now let's just cover. Uh, like a single type of shifter in isolation, like a left shifter or a right shifter. So um, if you're trying to do um, shifting, um, let me let me first note that I will probably allow myself to use constant shifting. Uh, I'll write code using constant shifting. So if I write something like this, uh, if x is a bit vector uh, in some of our circuits, and I write x uh, left shift 4, Note that this is really uh, just a shorthand. This doesn't really do anything for us. This is equivalent to um, basically uh, cutting off the last four elements of the vector and then sticking in uh, four bits at the bottom, if that makes sense. Um, so this is just a shorthand for this, but I'm going to be using the shift notation. But um, the difference is, this might seem circular, but it isn't, because really what we're trying to implement, we're not trying to implement a fixed shift, like a shift by one, which is just this kind of expression. It's just a simple uh, fixed uh, kind of uh, bit vector slice kind of thing and concatenation. Uh, but we're trying to implement it dynamically when we control the shift amount. So um, just to just to make sure that people understand that that it, I'm not being circular by using this notation by defining shift in terms of shift, really it's the idea to, is to define dynamic shift in terms of static shift if that makes sense. So um, suppose you wanted to well we have n equals four so maybe that's a good place to start. Um, suppose you wanted to um, to do a shifter for that. Now the shift amount for that can be either zero one two or three, and so there's a two bit shift amount. Um, and so suppose we do a left shifter, and um, I'm going to say x and n. So uh, x is going to be, both of these are going to be dynamic inputs, but x is going to be the bit vector you're shifting, and n is going to be another bit vector which has a logarithmic number of bits relative to x. And so I'm going to write an invariant here saying that if I take, um, if I take the length of n and raise it to, or if I take 2 to the power of this, I should get this. So, you know, 2 raised to 2 equals 4, for example. Um, and um, and so for, for a small value like this, you can actually just write it out as muxes. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is the basic idea. Actually, let me write down sort of the mathematical identity that makes this possible. It's not very deep at all. If I left shift, uh, if I first left shift x by m, m and I then left shift again by n, it's equivalent to 
just shifting once by the sum of the shifts, right? So I, if I shift left by three and then left by five, it's the same as shifting left by eight. That's the basic identity. It, it almost couldn't be simpler. Um, and the basic idea now is if you want to shift by uh, by some amount, you decompose the amount into basically into binary so that you, uh, which we already get it in. So it's very convenient because the shift amount is already expressed in binary. And we're simply going to uh, have a logarithmic number of stages where the first one can shift by either one or zero. The second one can shift by either two or zero. The, the third one can shift by either four or zero and so on. Uh, incidentally, you could also do it in reverse order. You could do the big shift first and then the smaller shifts for later down. But the point is, each of these stages will conditionally shift by a power of two. And by gating, by, by controlling uh, uh, which of those two possibilities occur by, uh, by a bit of the shift amount, uh, when we run something through that whole cascade, we get the, uh, the finally shifted output. So that's the idea. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is we're just going to shift it in successive stages. Um, and I guess you can go through these bits and I'll say I, I'm going to enumerate it. Um, and then I'm going to basically say X is replaced with, uh, and there's two possibilities. Um, if the bit is set, then we want to shift by that amount. Otherwise we don't want to shift by that amount. So if we're doing a left shifter, I'm going to left shift by two to the I so this starts out as being two to the zero that's one next it's two next it's four just like i said uh, but otherwise we just feed x through straight away and so this is a left shifter um let me just write a module uh a tester so we can kind of see what's going on here um and so here i'm going to uh Why the output? So this is going to be left shift, left shifter uh, x n. Um, this is length four. This is length three. What kind of shitty uh, I guess it really has to be this, right? Um, So um, let's just turn off all this stuff. Um, uh, uh, do timing analysis. Um, uh, and so let's try to instantiate that design. It works. Um, this is where I had the, no, I guess it's in, sorry, just fooling, trying to find out. Oh, here we are. Um, So this is obviously very trivial, and it doesn't really show um, sh show how powerful this is. I'm going to show it in a second with something wider, but you can see that um, so n comes in, so that's the shift amount. We first look at the lowest bit, and um, and we shift. You can see there's two things that can be fed through. Either it goes through uh, unmolested, untouched, if this bit is zero. Otherwise, we sh we we output the left shift by one, and this is the left shift by two, and it's uh, controlled by the second bit of the shift amount. So that's the idea. Let me uh, let me crank up uh, n to something more substantial, just so you can see the logarithmic pattern. Um, so uh, this is the kind of the simple way of doing it. Um, when you have a two to one mux, so if you think about what this thing is doing, it's selecting between two things, uh, either the shifted or the unshifted. Uh, uh, operands based on one bit 
Um, it's very common to, and in FPGAs and also in real shifters, to use four to, uh, four to one muxes, where rather than selecting between, uh, you know, the shift by zero, which is essentially what this is, if you think about it, and the shift by one, you select between the shift by zero, one, two, or three, and then for the next one, the shift by zero, four, eight, or you know, or is that, is that right? Four times uh, one, four times two, yeah, four, four, eight, and 12, and so on. So you can do a four to one mux. Uh, and that's, um, uh, actually, let's do that. Uh, let, let me make a, uh, um, just to illustrate it, I, I, this will be a primitive later in the language. I just haven't put it in. It's not really, uh, it's not difficult. I just hadn't prepared it for today. Um, but let, let's just put in a mux4 module that we can that we can use for this, um, and so um, we're going to have um, going to have a bunch of bit vectors, well four exactly, um, and then there's going to be a um, a two bit selection. And internally, I'm just going to implement it as two cascaded whens, just because that's what we have right now. Um, but um, you know, a, at a low level, this would usually be implemented as a single gate, basically, or a single lookup table if you're in an FPGA. So um, you you dispatch on the first bit, um, and then you dispatch on the second bit. And so um, let's see. Um, this is binary. Uh, so if both of them are one, then we want I3. If uh, if the least significant bit is zero, so that's uh, oh no, it's not zero. The least significant bit is still one, and now um, I guess it would be this one, and then for the other uh, it would be uh, uh, two and zero. So you could do it. Where's the shifter? Um, just going to make a mux four here to make it easy. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to I'm going to have the selection book first, actually. Um, So I'm going to call this radix two, and I'm going to call this radix four. Um, if we're doing it in radix four, we have to. Um, I'm going to maybe rewrite the logic slightly. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to go through the bits in a, with a stride of two, um, and well, and we can finish off with an extra, uh, an extra one if. Uh, if it's not even, but for now let's just say, or it's not divisible by by four, or is it divisible by two rather? So for now let's just assert that it's divisible uh, by two in the length. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, we're now going to basically take uh, n, uh, and I'll call this the selector, um, and then we're going to do a mux four, which goes um, either x, which is the zero case, x, and then you have to do i, uh, I guess, 2i, oh, let's see, it's, uh, so it's, what, is, what is it, sorry, zero or one, um, I mean, you're effectively you're multiplying by uh, you're you're uh, you're basically doing this uh, you're, this and then the successive the successive power of two. Or, which is equal to the sum. So I guess you can say. Uh, 
if 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 one is and then uh, so this is the third zero uh, zero one two so this should be i plus one and this and this should be uh, the sum of those two uh, and you want this to be the new x. This is, let's try rate x2. First, see if the thing compiles. Um, just make a new example so we don't overwrite stuff in place. Uh, input node cannot be interpreted as an integer. Oh, right. Does not work. Um, what is the bug? Uh, oh, this has to be marked an output. That was not the problem. Hmm. Let's see. So we thread x through as before. Um, at every stage, we select between x, x left shifted by that, x shifted by that plus 1, and x sh shifted by their sum. Here we hook everything up correctly as far as I can tell, and then return the output. Um, and the output selects between the various inputs, so that looks good. Um, and this is example 17. Okay, let's try just the shifter. Um, uh, must be something related to that. Okay, so that works. So here we're selecting between x, x plus 1, x plus 2, and x plus 3. Um, let's see. What did I do wrong? Well, let's see here. Uh, X has length 16. Oh, we are doing. Okay. Um, oh, it's. God, I'm an idiot. It's always the stupid typo level stuff that kills you. All right. So in order to shift by 16, you have a first stage that shifts by either 0, 1, or 0, 2, or 3, and you have a second stage that shifts by 4, 8, or 12. Um, and that's the idea. So you can see that, if, for example, if I wanted to shift by 15, I would shift by 3 here and by 12 here. And so that way we have half the number of stages compared to a two to one mux. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's exactly half the delay, but it turns out a, a four to one mux can be done efficiently. Um, and so this is, I think both actually in FPGAs and in ASICs, this is typically what you see is you see four to one muxes as the basic building block. I should mention that if you want to, let's remove this limitation. So it turns out that, um, um, 
you know, the number of, of shift bits was even, so it totally worked out. There was no remainder left over. If you're if you have a 32-bit shifter, um, then you're going to have some leftover, uh, and so you need to finish. You either need to have a six to one, uh, or more likely, what is it, 16, uh, or more likely you need to have a uh, uh, a two to one to finish things off. So that's what we're going to do. So if we do this, we should get a bug that assert should fire. Uh, and so what you have to do is you say um, if uh, if length of n uh, is not even, then you finish off with a single bit, and it's based on let's see, it's based on the very last uh, the very last bit of the shift amount, and it's going to select as before. Uh, between, in this case, it would be x shifted by um, two to the uh, two to the length of x minus one, length of n minus one, and so now we don't get the assert. And if we look at the circuit. Oh, right, we have to do it here. Um, we say this, if this is less, less, if, yeah, we can do it like this. Um, just do it inside the loop. And then we actually don't have to, special case, we can have the same stuff as before. Okay, so now we have two four to one uh, muxes, and then a final two to one mux to to uh, polish it off, which conditionally shifts by sixteen. So um, this is how, for example, this pattern is exactly how I've done shifters on FPJs before. Uh, a four to one mux fits exactly in a six LUT, very conveniently, not coincidentally, um, and uh, it also happens to be, I think, the the basic. Uh, sort of cascading element of uh, of ASIC shifters as well. So anyway, um, that's a single logarithmic shifter. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what's sometimes called an array shifter or a linear shifter because that's um, not a very useful uh, idea if you're just looking at it like like th this is I think already like th this is not complicated. This is just the obvious way of doing it in my opinion. Um, but you can imagine doing something where you can where you essentially have a linear number of layers, each of which shifts by one or zero. Uh, it does mean that the wires are much shorter. You only ever are kind of referring to your to your uh, either your predecessor or your predecessor's neighbor from the previous layer. But there's way more depth to it. Um, one 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 thing you might you are more likely to see in practice for things that are kind of linear esque is um, any kind of multi cycle shifter where you're not trying to do all of this in one cycle. Um, you might have, uh, for example, a uh, something that can shift by only one cycle or some small number of cycles uh, per cycle, and then you have to do multiple iterations if you want to do bigger shifts. Um, but uh, this kind of logarithmic shifter is really the only game in town as a basic element if you're doing it combinationally rather than sort of in a multi, you're trying to save area and doing it across multiple cycles. All right. Um, so the exact same thing works for um, the exact same thing works for uh, right shifting. You literally write the right the same thing, um, and uh, it also works for. And, and this is true whether you're doing um, uh, what do you call it, logical right shifts or arithmetic right shifts. Here I'm kind of hiding the differences by using this notation, like I explained right at the beginning, rather than using expl explicit bit uh, bit vector notation. But keep in mind that if we're doing the uh, if we're doing the um, the constant shifts, uh, well, even for right shifts, if this is an arithmetic or if this is a logical uh, shift, then this is equivalent to uh, putting. Uh, so, so here, imagine. Let me call it k, just to emphasize it's constant. Um, uh, if you're doing this, you put. Um, let's see. 
it's you throw out everything after k and then you concatenate uh, this at the top. So this is literally just an alias for, for all intents and purposes. If you're doing this, uh, let's use this notation for signed uh, for signs right, right shifts, aka arithmetic right shifts. Uh, what this changes to is that rather than just being unconditionally this, it has to be this, uh, like or you have to replicate this uh, k times. There's already an operator for that. Um, so you have to replicate the sign bit into the high positions. But um, other than this detail of how the constant variants work, the rest of it, uh, in terms of the, the way you cascade them, uh, is is basically the same. Uh, let's see here. Mm. Oh right, yeah. So 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 Fabian's saying, and I think you can see if you look at um, uh, if you look at this book, they have uh, the sort of linear barrel shifter style thing, which I think was called a barrel shifter back then, or maybe they called it a linear shifter. Where's the book? Introduction to VLI. Um, so 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 yeah. So uh, Fabian's saying it's not really n layers of logic. Uh, it's uh, sort of a, a crossbar type thing where you just have past transistors basically. Or tri-states, uh, if you don't want to use past transistors. But I think if you look at, I can't find it now. Maybe it's here. There used to be an online copy. If you look at this uh, sort of formative uh, old VLSI text, uh, and you look at the shifter design, um, you can see what Fabian is talking about. Let's see if how quickly I can I can bring it up. If it if it comes up quickly, then uh, uh, then we will uh, then I will show you. Uh, anyway, if you look up this book, they have a that style of linear shifter, which is based on, in their case, on tra past transistors rather than so-called tri-state muxes. Um, but it, yeah, data path, boom, boom, boom. It's in here somewhere. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can go and look it up. So yeah, so so I shouldn't have said that. It's not uh, n layers of logic. It's sort of a fast mux, but it, it's still pretty slow unless the, I think unless uh, Unless the the amount of shifting you're doing is not very high. All right. Um, so yeah. Anyway, I guess what I wanted to say is like basically this pattern works for left and right shift. It works for um, uh, unsigned or signed shifting. So I'm not going to show show that just because it's the same thing. Um, but um, another uh, another primitive I'm going to c quickly cover, but mostly because it's a, a it's a primitive in um, in a so-called barrel shifter um, is a rotator. So a rotator is the same idea, uh, but we're going to rotate rather than shift. So rotating is, you know, rather than shifting in zeros or copies of the sign bit, you're you're taking the bits that are going off one end and, and putting them in the other end. Um, and so um, it's uh, let, let's do the Radix 2 version first. Um, so here we're basically going to, instead of just using the shift, I'm going to use this explicit sort of bit vector slicing and concatenation notation. So what I'm going to do for the left rotator, um, and actually I'm just going to call it a rotator, um, and have the leftwardness be implicit because it turns out left and right rotate are the same just by complementary uh, values, which is why they're so useful. Uh, as a as a primitive as a building block, even if you're not necessarily interested in building rotators uh, in their own right, um, but rather than doing this, um, you have to um, you take out the top uh, b bits, uh, or you take out the top uh, you take out the top bits. So everything. Let's see, if it's left, you cut out those bits. So you you exclude the top elements. Uh, and then you put them uh, down here. Is that the right notation? So this, these are the least significant bits. No, it's, it's this. Least significant bits first. So least significant bits are essentially the, the high bits uh, from the old one, and then come the um, then come the other stuff, which is everything up to that point. Uh, and so let's see what that looks like, assuming I got it right.
Um, let's go back to uh, 16. So we have less clutter. Um, so let's see. So the first one corresponds to a conditional rotation by one. Um, and it selects between either the original operand or a new operand where the low bit is the previous high bit and uh, and the high bits are shifted versions of the previous low bits. So everything gets re-indexed. Uh, and here's the same thing. You can see this rotates by two. Um, the top two bits become the new uh, uh, two bottom bits and so on. And so it's the same thing, but um, same thing, but with rotation. Um, now the maybe let me call this left rotator, and then I'll show you how the right rotator can be written in terms of it. Um, so the basic. Um, the, the basic algebraic identity that you use to um, to transform left rotations into right rotations is that um, left rotate uh, by uh, by this is equivalent to right rotate by uh, by the complement, uh, which is the length of x as, as a bit vector minus n. Um, and so, for example, if this is uh, 16, if, if 16 is the length of x, then uh, rotating. Uh, I mean, let me show show it. Uh, let, let me show it uh, for a, uh, for a, a vector of four elements. If I left rotate, if I left rotate, if I left rotate this left by one position, I get this. Um, if I right rotate it um, by three, which is four minus one. I get what uh, a goes over three positions, so a is in the last position. Um, b wraps around, so it's the high thing, and you know, and so on and so on. So uh, this thing shift over. So you can see this is basically these two things are the same. So that's the identity that lets you do that, um, and so that means. Um, let, let me first show you the naive version and then the slightly optimized version. This means that you can uh, you can instantiate a, a left rotator, um, which um, simply uh, I'm going to write it just as minus x. Uh, minus x is actually the right value. The reason this is the right value is that modulo 32. Basically, all of this math is done. Uh, if you rotate by 32, it's the same as rotating not at all. Um, and so, when you say 32 minus uh, a value, it's the same as just saying minus that value modulo the thing. And since we're already the the, the two's complement math should already be kind of working correctly here for this. Uh, if we just write minus, uh, actually, have I implemented unary minus? That might be something we run into. But otherwise, you could write this temporarily, or you could write it. Or you could write it explicitly like this, um, which we will do in a second anyway. But anyway, you can do this. Um, and so if you compare what this is, you can imagine if you wanted to do left rotation, right rotation with the same unit, you have one of the orientations picked out fairly arbitrarily, say the left rotation direction, and then the right rotation direction is implemented by simply having an input mux that adjusts the shift amount. Um, And so we already saw the, let's see if we can get this to work. I think it's going to complain about the unary minus. Uh, I'm actually going to implement that immediately uh, because I, uh, let's see, Python magic method, unary minus. It's probably neg, right? Yeah. So, okay, let's just do that. This will take a second. Um, Um,
Okay, let's see what this looks like. So you can see that all this does is you have the previous structure, but now we are negating it um, before feeding feeding it into the left rotator. Um, so um, this is really the, the this is not something that's true for left and right chest if you think about it because those are lossy, so you can't implement you know. Uh, like you, you they're, they're kind of you know one way is sort of like you lose information so you can't get it back by rotating by 32 or whatever the way which, which, which this identity relies on or you can't you can't get you if you shift by 32 you get zero or all ones if it's an arithmetic right shift but you, you you can't recover your information so this really th this symmetry relies on the fact that this thing has a period where it comes back to the original value um so this is an interesting building block, even if rotation in its own right is not something you find super appealing. Um, and we're going to use it in a sec. All right. Um, I should mention, and I, we might as well do this while we're looking at it here. Um, one thing that you almost always see when you're using this uh, implementation of right rotation in terms of left rotation um, is that you do what's called pre-rotation. And so uh, let me uh, just write this as a comment to indicate this is sort of the underlying thing we're trying to compute. Um, the first thing you do is you replace minus n by its two's complement expression, in which case we don't need the unary minus anymore. Um, and then you say, well, actually, um, if you think about it, um, you can get rid of this plus if you pre-rotate the input by one. So just as with uh, shifts where we have this additive identity, if I shift by i and then shift by j, it's the same as shifting by i plus j, you have the same identity for rotations. And so if I'm to, supposed to shift by the bitwise knot of n plus 1, I can just pre-shift by 1, and then uh, I, I don't have to do the carry propagate addition. I can just do the bitwise negation of the, of the shift amount. Um, and so that's usually done. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think it's a huge win, but I just want to mention it because it's a neat little trick, and you see it in the literature. And so, if you do it that way, uh, what you have to do is uh, you have to just basically pre-rotate by uh, by one, which means um, uh, the least significant bit is the previous most significant bit, uh, and then uh, afterwards you get everything uh, else. So this is just an optimization. I'm going to leave it here in a comment just to indicate that this has the same meaning. Um, and actually, let's test that because we've written a bunch of code and we haven't tested it. Um, we have our test stuff. Let's test it. Uh, I'm going to um, well, maybe they're not so expensive. Uh, we should test with small values anyway. Um, let's see if these tests still run. It would be nice if they did. So uh, actually, let's actually go back uh, and 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 test the earlier uh, shifters based on muxing. Uh, just so you know, I'm not uh, blowing smoke up your ass. Uh, so um, the first one was example 16, and x, n, and y. Okay. Um, and so example 16, and um, going to go through all uh, all uints, and then for n, I'm going to go through, uh, I guess, uh, I'm going to call this 2. Actually, just n. Um, and then I'm going to assert that if you do this mask shift, so this is Python code, it's executing immediately, not constructing a circuit. We should test that um, that um, that this um, evaluates to the same thing. Let's see if it does. It does. Let's check it with 17, which I believe was the Radix 2 or Radix 4 shifter. And it works. 
Um, so that was the radix two, radix four. Let's do the right rotator. Um, let me do a helper function here. This might get a little bit confusing, so I'm going to call it something short that looks imposing, like rot l. Um, and it's going, and we need to know the width of it actually, um, because we're working with arbitrary precision arithmetic. So we need to know where to wrap around. Um, um, let's say, I don't know. I guess we know n, right? So what we can, and we have mask, so we can say. Um, uh, X shifted over uh, mask, and then um, X shifted in the other direction, um, and then you have to say N minus N. So big N would be 16 or whatever, and then that minus the shift amount. This doesn't have to be, no, that's not right, like that. Um, And this doesn't have to be shifted because we're shifting in that direction. So um, let's try that version two. Actually, let's do left and right separately. Um, so this is 19. And let's do the the left rotator for that. Um, and uh, we want to verify that this is equal to, we don't even need to mask actually because we have an implicit masking in the operation itself. So rote l equals y, let's see if this works. That works. Um, suspicious. Uh, let's test that this doesn't work because this should be the opposite direction. Oh, it should be using 19. This should not work because we we should be doing rotate right. And even though I could express rotate right in terms of rotate L, but let, let me sort of redundantly implement it directly just so um, we don't get fooled into thinking it works when it doesn't. So this does have to be masked because we're left shifting. So now all the tests pass in the first try. Um, so yeah, uh, so we have our tests. And I'd only tested with four elements, but I think you can probably realize, I mean, like, again, I. I was actually looking in the literature since last time to see if I can find references to proof principles that where you can appeal to some sort of genericity or parametricity with respect to the width and the shape of the inputs in order to conclude that if it works for small widths, it works for all widths or something like that. Um, and I found some interesting stuff, but maybe a little bit too theoretical. Um, but that's sort of the same idea here. Like if we test for four, I have confidence that it basically works, period. Pretty good confidence. So, um, so anyway, so this implements this identity here, and uh, this is the more complicated version where we'd already done this pre-shift and then the bitwise negation. So this is how you do uh, right rotation in terms of left rotation or vice versa. You can choose either of them as the basic thing. Um, oh, for signed values, yeah, that's a good call. It's not no point in not skimping out on it. Um, All right. Um, so yeah. So so now um, now we're going to go to our first uh, kind of combined design, and it's going to use a rotator as a primitive, and it's called a barrel shifter. Um, a barrel shifter basically uses a left rotator, for example, or a right rotator as a primitive, and from that it implements left rotation, obviously, right rotation, left shift, right shift logical, right shift uh, arithmetic. So basically implementing all the operations um, using this basic permutation structure. 
um, and then doing some um, putting some muxes on the inputs like uh, like this one where we uh, we have a <clears throat> we have a mux that pre shifts and we have a mux that uh, conditionally negates uh, n if uh, you're doing a right rotation. Um, and then you also need masking logic on the output because basically the idea is going to be to do a right shift, we do a right rotate, um, and then, or or let's say left shift, since that's the direct thing we implement. Let's say we do a left shift. We're basically going to do a left shift by left rotating and then masking the bits out. And this is going to seem backwards to software people because you're so used to shift being the thing that you have and rotate being the thing you have to synthesize. But here we're doing it the other way around. We're using rotate to synthesize shift by doing the rotation which gets the bits we care about in the right position, and then we can just kill the bits we don't care about. That's the idea. Um, so that's a barrel shifter. And so just like our adder subber comparator thing, this is going to be a combined unit that has some control inputs that that, that uh, modifies the uh, the behavior, but basically has unified structure for the big pieces, like the basic permutation network is shared between all five of those different functions. Um, so that's a barrel shifter. Um, so I'm going to have, um, actually before we, do, I, I, be, be, before I do the combined function, let me, uh, let me just write, uh, something that just does the left shift and we could, then we can put the muxing around it that does the right thing for the different kind of operation. But let me just show you sort of piecemeal. If I just want to make a left shifter from a rotator, how do I do it? Then we can test that. Then I'll do the same thing for uh, right shifting and we'll test that. And then I'll put them together with the muxes in order to select between the operations because that last part is not really uh, very uh, complex if you understand how all the specific uh, operations can be synthesized from left rotation. Um, all right. so. We want to do a left shift. So what do we do? Uh, we uh, we uh, we rotate by the same amount, and then we have to make a mask, and then we simply mask. So maybe let me just write it like that. Um, so we just do this, and then we have to create a mask. So our job is to create a mask, and what what does this mask have to be? The mask has to be. Um, it has to be one if we want to retain the position and zero if we don't want to retain the position. So I'm actually just going to write it in a straightforward way. Um, and you, uh, in for example, an FPGA, this is the, the way I would write it. Um, I'm just going to say for every bit in X, um, let's see. Um, so we iterate it over the, the indices of bits in X, which is the thing we're shifting. Um, for every bit in X, I'm going to see if um, if we are in a position that is after, so we're left shifting, which means that the position we want to retain are the high positions. So if I is greater than or equal to the shift amount, then we want to have a one bit. And I'm going to write this uh, using an inequality in a way that seems like this is really expensive. Um, but I'm, I'm, you, you can synthesize the equivalent of this comparison very cheaply, basically. So the fact that it looks like we're doing an expensive, expensive arithmetic operation shouldn't confuse you. This is really a very cheap kind of uh, thing you compute per bit. Um, and an FPGA, for example, if, uh, if you have six input bits for a 64-bit rotator, that would be a six to one LUT that just has a hard-coded comparison against a fixed uh, index. So I is, is a constant for, for a given bit, N is the variable part. Um, so um, let's um, let's again turn that in. So I'm going to call it what did I call it? Left shifter, left, barrel left shifter. Um, and that's 20. And so I want to compare to the same kind of thing we were comparing before. I may, may have gotten this wrong. If so, we'll see. Left rotator, this was radix 2. 
Okay, so that doesn't work, but probably because I just, let's see here. Oh, I haven't implemented comparisons. Um, uh, binary ops. No, I did. Didn't I? Isn't that what is right here? Um, Oh God, no comma. Is that really a thing? Does it do implicit string concatenation? Okay, so this doesn't work. Oh, and that's because I'm not evaluating the right module. Okay, now it does work. Um, so does this make sense? By the way, this is the kind of code that, in my opinion, a good HDL makes way easier to do than a traditional software language. It's so sort of good for working with bit vectors. You can write this stuff. So it's very easy to write these kinds of, like in this case, a mask. So this is, a, you know, this defines a bit per vector. I say it's a bit vector, and now I can just end it in like anything else. Um, so uh, that's the power of a good notation, basically. Yeah, I've never seen that implicit string notation. That's almost like the C preprocessor. I didn't know that was a thing in Python. All right. Um, and so I'm not going to show you how this can be implemented efficiently because it's not, it's just a low level, like it's a specific pattern you're looking at. You can optimize it for a given bit. You can maybe share a little bit between different bits, but especially, but, but it's something that because there's so few input bits, it can just be kind of like you can make like a single gate that or a couple of gates that does that. Um, and I'm not going to emphasize so much exactly that. Is that's We could do that and maybe you can do that if you're interested. But um, on an FPGA, this, this, this would synthesize to the optimal thing anyway. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So uh, and, and you can do the same thing with right shifting. Um, and it's uh, you can do right rotator. Uh, and then what, what, what has to change? Well, the logic is now different. Um, when we're, uh, we want to, um, let's see, if, uh, if you're a low bit, if you're, if you're less than 32, uh, or length X minus N, then you're good. So if, if N is zero, let's just check, I think maybe this, if, if N is zero, then this is just say 32 minus zero and every index is less than that. If it's one, then this is going to be uh, 32 uh, minus one, which is 31, which is going to exclude the top bit, but no, nowhere else. Okay, so I think that's um, that's the right comparison. And I'm going to, let's see. Um, I'm going to write it like this. Um, I mean, it, uh, it's going to be cast the right way. So, so all I'm doing here, so what, what we had before is this was length of n minus n. I'm just trying to isolate n, which is the dynamic operand, just to get a point the, the point across that I don't have to do anything to n directly. Um, this is uh, n minus length is less than minus n, and then that is equivalent to minus, uh, my, you know, or uh, length x minus i is less than n. Something like that. Um, by the way, I don't think I ever explained this. Um, the way I infer literal types for uh, uh, for things. It's very simple. Basically, you know, this computation on the left hand side is a Python big int. But as soon as, it, but if a Python big int occurs in the context of a binary operator um, where the other side is known, so this has a known size of, you know, however many bits, 
uh, this thing is always interpreted, uh, is given a type in that context for the first time, right? So that's how effectively the type inference works when you could go from a arbitrary position Python thing, which is kind of a literal from the language, from the HDL's perspective to a concrete uh, bit vector type. Um, zero and one are always assumed in the absence of anything else to have length one. All right, um, so that was, uh, let's test that one as well. And then we'll finally do the combined barrel shifter, which is just putting all this together with muxes to select between the different cases. 2021. This has to be the right shifter. Um, okay, that doesn't work. Probably an off by one. So if I if I shift one by zero, that should obviously oh no okay this I, I did update the test uh, correctly so x is that and clearly this should uh, this should just be uh, one uh, equal to the original x but i is zero so must be an off by one. Um, it could be the way this stuff is converted. Let's see. Um, but let's let's read out the logic. Uh, length. Um, If uh, if n is zero, um, let me see here. For the bottom bit, which is the one that isn't right in our case, i is zero. This seems wrong, right? If i is I guess it's like this. Um, let me start with the original thing again I wrote. Um, any position which is less than this minus n so in the original case, uh, actually, and l l l let me write that first, and then I'll do the transformation. So, because if, if 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 somehow I brain farted on this, then the other stuff is not going to to work. Okay, um, let me show you my super duper tracing code. I think we, I showed it last time, but it's better now. So basically, uh, when you compile, you can provide a keyword argument that says trace, and then it, it compiles in the tracing code, but you still have, on a given evaluation, you still have to enable it. Um, okay, this is not going to be super easy to read. I also need a way to uh, be able to annotate specific nodes in the graph to have them trace so that you can correlate you know, what they look like in the original definition to what they're compiled to. Um, What was where was I with that code? So if n is equal to one zero, then all the bits should satisfy it, and indeed this is satisfied for all those bits. If n is equal to one, then this is satisfied for everything except the top bit. Probably the issue is that these the way I've written them, they don't really have enough bits to express this. Um, If this is done in two's complement, 
in theory that should be the equivalent um let me just go and look at printing the code for a sec Um, hmm. What was the original here? If I is less than that. I mean, let me just avoid to avoid potential issues with. Uh... Isn't this correct? Let me let's do it again. If I is if n is zero, then this is equivalent to i less than length, which is true for every i. n is equal to one, so it's like, uh, for example, i less than 32. Next, for n equals one is i less than 30, uh, 31, which is true for everything except 31 itself, which is the topmost bit. Um, n is literally zero. Oh, so x minus n is zero because, <sighs> yeah, I see why that is. Um, Um, so this is not masking out the top bit in this case. Oh. Well, print, ah. which one outer assertion has access to mask? It's a sorry, it's another mask, uh, which is maybe a little bit confusing. This is the local mask, and the other one is. Uh, the mask corresponding to the the number radix. I mean, I can print the mask, but then I have to. Well, okay. I can export it. Um, let me do that.
Okay. Uh, Okay, so n is 1, and this is the mask, which should have the, uh, the this top bit equal to 0. Um, So just to verify, when we did it before without the extended uh, bit for the comparison, the mask was just zero, so everything was getting masked. Okay, that works. Let me write it like this for now. I, I, it's because it's doing an unsigned comparison, basically. Um, but I, I don't want to... That stuff is not... Like, I kind of wanted to just treat the mask logic uh, in, in terms of exactly what gates are used to compute it uh, as a black box, uh, because it's not really the interesting part. But um, for now, I'm going to write it like this, even though that's not, you know, in the same spirit, but not how I was planning on writing it. All right. Um, let's just verify a final time that works. <laughs> no. Oh, we're still returning the mask. That's why. Okay, thank God. Okay, so... Uh, again, let's just treat this as a black box. The stuff you're seeing there had to do with signed versus unsigned comparison. Now I brought everything to one side uh, and with an, a, an extra bit for the comparison as well. But I don't want you to think that this requires a real addition or a real sign extension. Again, it's just really think of it as a lookup table that takes, for example, five or six bits in and spits out a single bit. If you're an FPGA, there would be a single LUT. This would be no more expensive than anything else. Uh, if you're an ASIC designer, you would have some fancy, you know, you you would you would fret over the exact set of gates and how they're shared or whatever. But um, this is a case where I'll sort of invoke FPJ designer's privilege and just say this is a six LUT up to 64 bits. So, um, and and call it a day. So anyway, so now that we have this, you can see that we have. Um, oh, uh, actually, let me do arithmetic shift as well. Uh, uh, I'll call this logical right shifter, uh, barrel right shifter, just to really complete the standard textbook barrel shifter. Uh, just make sure it still works. Um, now the main thing we're going to change is the mask is going to be data dependent. Um, So now, if you think of what this mask is, it's going to be zero. I'm going to change this to be a mux. It's going to be the same condition. Um, oh no, sorry, I, it's not quite data dependent. Uh, let's see how to. What's the easiest way to do it? It's not just a mask. You, uh, you need a mux in this case. Um, Let me think about how I want to write it. Um, I mean, you you can have a different or thing. 
no so, yeah it's it's i see it's kind of like a mask but it's you smear it instead of ending it so it's now zero it's now zero where you don't want to have stuff um and you or in uh versions of the sign bit in the upper positions so that it basically kills every, so it so it saturates everything up there and so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to use this uh, this thing, which is going to be, actually, I'm going to use the reverse version of this. Uh, so I'm going to use this uh, less than or equal to this, I think, um, because now we're oring it. And then I'm going to end this with the sign bit. So this thing, so this first part here is now going to be uh, one for the high bits that, that would normally be shifted you know that, that would you would get rotated into uh and then if it's one there i want to basically take this uh, sign bit and then i want to smear this everywhere uh that's my plan i can't remember if that's the sort of the textbook approach but this seems reasonable um it's possible almost certainly when we start when we combine these in a second into a single unit um that some of these things can be shared or something like that Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, you're never, sorry, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right with it. Um, so, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, slight change of plans. Um, I'm going to write a bitwise expression, which um, is the same thing we had up here. If that is true, then I want the original bit, um, which I'm going to call B uh, from Y. Otherwise, I want the sign. And so this is going to be for IB in enumerate Y. So first we do the rotate, that's Y. Then I do the enumerate, so I have both the bit index and I have the value of the bit. And I do this comparison that we previously just used to mask it, but now instead of uh, just selecting B, which would, if we if, if we wanted B or zero, we could use the and, but because we want B or the sign bit, we have to use a mux. So yeah, uh, thanks for catching that, Fabian. Um, and so let's see if that works. Uh, in order to do that, we have to I'm going to use ints because now it's a signed shift. And um, I'm not sure if uh, I don't think I should do the mask. Because well, let me remind myself: if I do this in Python, what happens? Yeah. So I. Well, I guess I do want to do that. Actually, I'm just going to interpret it. Yeah, that's fine. Um. As long as this part here, like if I do. Um. Okay, so that does the right thing, um, or I think it does. Looks like it does. This should be example 22. And this is s ints to be explicit, signed ints. Okay, that works. So yeah, that works. Um, okay, so now, if we just put all the pieces together, we have a uh, a barrel uh, a barrel shifter, and um, so what we need to do is we need to provide x n and we need to provide basically some operation bits that control um, the function, and so you can see that one thing we need to do is um, we need to control the pre shifter. 
Um, and so I'm going to have one called deer. And so deer is basically going to be um, if deer is set, then we are going to pre shift. Um, and then also, if deer is set, we are going to bitwise negate. Um, otherwise, pass through. Incidentally, if you want to be fancy about it, uh, you can actually tuple. So when distributes over tuples, which is sometimes nice when you want to express sort of related lo uh, lo uh, conditional logic. So x and n, uh, you can do this, comma, not, and then otherwise pass through. Um, so this is the input mux where we, you know, do the pre-shift conditionally and we bitwise negate conditionally. And we again, we could have just done a bitwise negation, but that would have done a carry propagate, which is slightly slower. Um, so this is a little trick. And then we do the uh, the left row. Let's we can move to the radix four by just literally changing one character. But let's uh, but let's just uh, you know use what we've already tested in our examples. And so now we we feed this in, uh, and then we have to do some masking, and um, and let's see how we can combine these. And so um, I will call this shift. Uh, and I will call this signed or something like that, um, or Aerith. Um, and so um, first off, if, uh, if there is no shift, then the result is just Y. Um, and so it's only when the, the, the when shift is set that we need to do some stuff. Um, the difference between left and right, let's see if I can figure out an easy way to unify it. Um, <clears throat> um, just write it out like that so we can write it in multiple lines. So um, left shift versus right shift as far as the permutation network is handled by just, you know, by, by using the direction bit. Um, but once you have a shift, um, you kind of have to handle, uh, let me just sort of write that, let me write it out here. Um, if you're doing, um, so by default it's left, right? So if deer is set, it means so. If uh, if deer is one, we have to do some stuff. If deer is not one, then the mask is. Maybe the way you do it is this. Um, Um, let's see. Um, when we're shifting, when we have an arithmetic shift, um, yeah, no, I think the the idea of always using a mux makes sense. Um, So then what you do, I think, is uh, I mean, maybe you write something like this, and then you say, um, and this is, let me, let me write something that works, and then I'll find out ways to optimize it. Um, Uh, 
um, this is the mask. And then if you're doing arithmetic shifts, um, and let's say arithmetic shift is only set if you're also, you know, you don't have to, there's no such thing as an arithmetic left shift. Um, so then we will do uh, basically bits when, and then we'll just reference the mask um, b x minus whatever for i b in enumerate y. Um, that's not what I meant to write. When er when you have an arithmetic thing. Um, Then you check this, and you selectively between them. If you don't have an arithmetic thing, then you can just do the bitwise mask like this. When did that disappear? So that's left rotator radix 2 xn. Um, so this is the mask. And then y shift. And this is over right rotate. And then you select between y shift and y rotate. Something like this. Um, So do the pre-mux with the pre-shift, or the pre-negation conditionally with the pre-shift. Do the rotation by that, then construct this mask uh, corresponding to the two directions. Let me just verify this is the same thing we do. Yep. Um, and then we have this thing, which is what's used when you're doing a shift. And this is a bitwise thing. Uh, if you're doing an arithmetic shift, then you do this. Uh, if you want, you can move it up here and do it down here. In which case, um, this would be uh, when that is true, you want B. Um, And then else, you either want zero or this. So when the mask is set, you always pick the original bit. Otherwise, conditional on whether uh, it's one or the other, you can actually do this. Um, let me just read, uh, read through this and, and see if I agree this is the right thing. So for a given bit which has value b and is at index i, you check whether the mask bit for that is true, which means we want to retain the, the bit from the rotate operation, and if so we do that. Otherwise, uh, there's basically two cases. Uh, it, it's normally zero, but if it's arithmetic uh, shift and the sign bit is set, then that becomes the thing to fill. Okay, I think that's right. So let's do, let's make a test module based on this. How are we doing on time? One and a half hours. Um, I'll keep going. I'll, I want to do a final shift or two. Um, 
I guess we let's use the same stuff. What were the thing? What were the operations called? Um, right. So. Uh, deer is a single bit, uh, shift is a single bit, and Harith is a single bit. And then Y is barrel shifter X and deer shift Earth. <clears throat> y is not defined. So yeah, we need to do uh, for i in range length of x oh you want to move the output mux into um, Let me just test this, and then I'll try to maybe push stuff in and out in terms of the formula. And this was example 23. Oops. So I am going to basically just... Uh, Let's start with uh, rotation. Let's see, basically for the rotate case, just force mask to all one. Okay, let, let me just, uh, if, if you don't mind, let me just uh, verify that this works and then I'll uh, think about the next thing before I fill my head with something else. Um, so here we're doing, what were the arguments? Um, dear, if we're, if we're doing left shift, or uh, yeah, if we're doing left rotation, then uh, all of these are set as follows. And you want to verify that this wrote L xn is equal to y, so that's should be the, the pass-through path. Okay, that doesn't work. So what do we get? Oh, right, 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 right. I have to select what component. Okay, so that works. Um, I'm just going to have separate loops for uh, for each of these cases. So then if I do uh, this, it should be right rotation. And that seems to work. Um, let's do... Uh, left shift that seems to work so far so good we haven't really gotten I guess to the stuff that was a little more fiddly for us originally let's do a right shift non-arithmetic okay that doesn't work so one shifted by two, that should be zero. Python agrees, hopefully. Um, but we are getting four, what was X? So that is not masking off the top bit. And so this is for the case, uh, deer is one, Shift is one, irith is zero. <clears throat> um, let's 
So this was the mask. This is the thing that is true where we want to retain the bits. Um, and we had verified that up here um, based on deer being one or not. So that looks good. Um, this part I don't suspect. Uh, and so now here, um, Aerith should be zero. So this whole thing should be when mask, then B, L, zero, which is and. So it's, this is the same as an and by the mask in the case where Aerith is zero. Um, Let me print out the mask again, since uh, we had good luck with that last time. Uh, Um, print resolved up mask. Oh, but now you're passing in. I gotcha. Okay, okay. Um, Thanks, that would have taken forever to catch, actually. So, um, let me just move the logic here. So, when deer, it's not in. And Okay, now we pass. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, let's do the arithmetic shifts. So now, dear one, shift one, and arith one. There you go. That's a barrel shifter. But let, let's now go back and look at Fabian's suggestion for um, removing some of the output muxes. For the rotate case, just force mask to all ones. Oh, I see. So when shift, when shift, do this. Uh, else you have, I'll just call it minus one. Maybe I'll call it this, which is the same, but just maybe more evocative. Um, and this type inference should work for this. Uh, then I should be able to just return this unconditionally. Actually, let's let's keep the mask for now because I if this optimization doesn't work, I have to debug it. Okay, that worked. Thanks, Fabian. That was very simple. Oh yeah, now we have to remove that comma mask.
And we should also just be able to shift in this and have it just work. Uh, except I guess we didn't do the Radix 4 version of left rotate. Uh, but we can do that quite quickly. Um, for i in enumerate 0, uh, or uh, from range to 0 to this in steps of 2, and we then have two cases, uh, which is if i plus 2 is less than or equal to length of this, then we do a, well, in the other case, we do basically this. Um, Sorry, this is on the length of n, not x. Um, and so then you have to do i in this case, and i from these two bits in that case. And we do a mux4. Um, and the four cases are. Uh, the original, uh, this one, uh, this one, and I guess this one. Probably worth breaking that out. <laughs> um, let me call it. Let me just yeah. Let, let me give some names to those shift amounts um, or rotate amounts. Um, what's good names for those? Uh, it's called M zero. Or uh, M1 is to the I. This is to the I plus 1. This is M1 plus M2. Let's put this in a single line. So this is M1, M1, M2, M2, 3, M3. Um, let me actually uh, before I plug it into the barrel shifter, let's uh, take this case here and just move it to four, just to, so we can test it piecemeal. Okay, so that works. Um, let's just look at it. To, to, okay, we already have this thing anyway. to see if it looks reasonable. Um, if the shift amount is zero, then we don't do anything. Here we shift by yeah, that looks reasonable. Uh, let's say n equal to eight. Actually, 16. But actually, this was a good case to test too. Um, let's do 16. Oh, it's still running. It's because we still have the expensive uh, brute force tests that are like n squared in the number of elements. So let me just uh, remove those. 
and squared things. Where are we spending time? Okay, anyway, the stuff I wanted to test was earlier um, in the chain of tests, so uh, I guess that worked with the Radix 2. Um, looks reasonable. Let's try plugging it into uh, let me do it like this. Uh, let's go back to four. So that works with that case. Let's try with four. That works too. <clears throat> Let's look at the barrel shifter. <coughs> the huge beast, I'm sorry for coughing. Into the mic, 23. Um, where was my graph dumping code? Oh, you're right. Yeah. That's much better. Better notationally. I mean, that is what they mean, but I don't know why. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of multiples, but that's much cleaner. So yeah, this is the this is the graph. Um, you please don't look at the pluses because that's the mask logic, and like I said, that's going to basically vanish once a real logic synthesis thing is done with it. I just don't want to focus on that kind of fiddly low-level uh, stuff for for for, uh, for this unit. And so, well, this is I guess a little bit trivial since there's only one level of muxing. Let's actually go back to the uh, Radix 2, just so you can see some, at least two levels of stuff. And actually, let's, um, or not, Radix, let's do Radix 4 and n equals, uh, let's do 16. So I'm just going to run it until it's generated the, uh, the file. Okay, so the mask gener. The mass generation looks more bulky than it really is, but this is the mass coming over here. Um, and so you can kind of see that, so I guess this is the important point about, uh, I, I should have mentioned that. One of the important points about a barrel shifter is that even if the mass generation is not the simplest in the world, and in our case, it looks more scary than it really will be in a real implementation, uh, it's off the critical path basically because uh, you generate the mask, and you can see it because of the way it sorts this graph here. But this is the mask that comes out here. All of that stuff is being done in parallel to the routing to the permutation network uh, for the rotator. So there's the mux here and the mux here, and here you have the output mux, which uh, you know takes the mask uh, where we should be able to find the. Uh, let's see. It's hard to see exactly what's going on. So this is the output. So we're splitting out the different bits, and we are. Th these are the mask bits. But the, we're, I want to figure out where the sign bit is coming from. I see. So here, so this thing here comes partly from the sign bit, 
which is bit 15, right? So this is the and, this, this node here on the very right is the and of the sign bit and the arithmetic node. So that controls the, the this is the else result for this mux. So the mask controls the cont, then is the output of the mux network uh, that does the rotation, and the else is this um, this fill bit, which is uh, you know zero uh, or um, or the equal to the sign bit, depending on whether what kind of thing you're dealing with. All right, so I think that's it for the barrel shifter. Um, So you can see this is a lot of stuff with one unit. Um, and even if you, an alternative to doing this, uh, which if you're just doing, for example, left and right or something like that, um, left and right shifting, uh, the alternative to this is just to have completely independent left and right shift networks and then just do muxing on the outputs. So then depending on what operation you're doing, you select one of the results of those individual networks. But this is sort of a way, like I said, kind of like how a two's complement adder can do a lot of things with just a few configuration bits. This is sort of the same idea applied to a barrel shifter. Uh, that was almost two hours. Uh, I'm going on. I'm going to Denmark uh, in a day and a half, so I kind of want both today and tomorrow to do some extra stuff. So I'm actually going to continue um, and see if we can do a funnel shifter before I shut off for the day. It should be a little bit simpler, but uh, those are famous last words. Yeah, no, I, I was going to cover funnel shifters, but I guess it took longer to get this working. But um, on the other hand, it works now. Uh, funnel shifters. So, um, uh, so, so, like, so, so, barrel shifters are based on rotation as the primitive permutation operation, and then you primarily just have to generate a mask in order to mask out, or in some cases, select an alternative bit um, from that uh, rotation. Um, there is another popular approach to doing shifters, uh, which is called uh, funnel shifting. Uh, and unlike barrel shifters, which are based on rotation, funnel shifters are actually based on shifters as the primitive thing that does everything. Um, and the idea is that you're going to have a double width. Um, you're going to have a double width uh, thing that you're selecting a half width result out of. So normally, when you're doing a shift, you think of it as you know, regard, depending on whether you're doing a left or a right shift, you think of sort of shifting in zeros because there's nothing there. But suppose you had a 64-bit result, or sorry, suppose you start with, a, for example, a 64-bit value, and you want to se select a 32-bit slice of that. Um, that by itself is a 32-bit shift because as long as you don't fall off the end of that 64-bit word, the lowest offset is zero, the highest is 32. If it's 32, you're perfectly selecting the, the, the upper half of that 64-bit word, but any value between zero and 32 will basically select a different slice. Um, and so by having just a single shifter um, as, the, as sort of the, the, the network that you're kind of building things around, um, rather than doing masking on the output side, the art then becomes how can you generate the right source, uh, the, the double width source, in order to synthesize the different operations. Um, and um, so that's basically the idea. Um, so let's... Uh, Maybe we'll take the same general approach of synthesizing the individual operations out of it just to give you a feel for it, and then we'll unify the, the, the MUX in order to do the source generation. Um, all right. So, yeah, funnel shifter. Uh, idea is to uh, synthesize everything uh, out of... Um, out of a 2n to n so uh, double with uh, input single with output um, that's the idea and so um, if you want to so rather than thinking of it as really a shifting, you can think of it as just selecting a window out of a bit vector, uh, right? Like, so you have a, uh, 
conceptually uh, y is x just like this. That's the idea. This this is the basic primitive. Um, this is the basic primitive. I is dynamic. So much like a shifter, we have to synthesize this out of a cascade of constant slicing. Uh, and, and the identity you use for that is the same sort of thing you use for uh, for other stuff, which is like if you if you let's see if you do this kind of slice, it's equivalent to first slicing that and then slicing you know this basically that's kind of the idea and so by a similar kind of cascaded power of two approach uh, you can decompose this into a bunch of stages each of which does a mux um, and so I'm not sure what you would normally call that like the basic primitive funnel shifter is the thing as a whole I don't, maybe i'll just call it a double width uh shifter or something like that and so if you look back to my original asserts um i had this uh but here it's actually going to be um You know, basically, if x if x is 64, I want the number of bits to be 32. Does that make sense? Because I'm selecting a slice out of it. I'm never running off the end the way I was previously. Um, okay, let me think about the best way to write that, which I actually haven't written before. Uh, unlike some of this other, I haven't written a barrel. Actually, I haven't written a barrel shifter before either. So. But let me think about how we want to write that. Um, I think at every stage you want to do um, um, at every stage let's see I guess at each, if, if you want to build a, I guess this is where I hadn't thought about it before, so maybe I'll abort this if I get into too much trouble, but let's try. Uh, if if you start with 64 bits, so with a normal shifter, like a logarithmic shifter, um, you basically have 32 bits at every stage. I think in this case, you cut down on the number of bits in every stage by how many bits you slice, sliced off. Basically, yeah, okay, according to this identity I just wrote. Um, and so I think what you do at every stage is you, um, based on this bit, you either select, if it's set, um, you slice off from here from here to the end, otherwise from here, like you kind of cut off the last part, I guess, something like this. Um, I think that's the logic. Like you basically, like I, you either cut off the beginning or you cut off the end, um, basically. So in both cases, these slices have the same length which our type checker will verify for us. Um, okay, we should <laughs> move this back to something reasonable. Double width. Uh, I think that's right. Um,
let's uh, actually I want to see n for a reasonable number so I can actually get a feel for whether the structure is correct. Uh, uh, let's see, that's 2n, n is still equal to c log 2n minus 1, and y is double width shifter xn. Do tests. So let's turn off the tests just for a sec. Um, this should be in numerate n. Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's see here. For the least significant bit, we select this or that, and then we select. Yeah, so at every stage, uh, this is off by one. I get why this would be off by one. Um, You either skip the first element or you don't. Um, and here you go two, and this is two on top of this, or zero, but 29 in either case. This is maybe right, and it's just a side effect of the structure. Um, Let me think. The biggest amount I can shift by with this decomposition is 15, and that is indeed going to give me um, Do I need to be able to shift by 16 exactly? In which case, I need an extra bit on the shift amount. Um, maybe Fabian. I mean, I, so I so I actually I see why this is true. It's because one plus two plus four plus eight is 15. So I'm subtracting 15 from 32. That's 17, not 16. Um, in terms of what this corresponds to, it's basically like if I shift by 15, it means I'm getting the I'm getting the last the second half of the word and then the last bit of the first word. Um, okay. But does it make sense that with this decomposition, does it just mean that the vector itself should be, it shouldn't be double width, it should be double width minus one? Do you know what I mean? Like, um, if I had this. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll call this the funnel shifter, even though I guess it also refers to the whole structure, the configurable uh, shifter rotator built around it. All right, um, so anyway, that's the basic primitive. Uh, let's verify that it works. 
with some tests. I'm going to start retiring some of these tests uh, for now, but just by commenting them out, um, just so we I don't have to deal with them. Um, did the power just go? No. I, by the way, there, there's a weird feeling I've, I've learned in Thailand where you think you're you're dying or something because the power goes out simultaneously, and so the the AC stops, the light goes out, and the fan that's pointing on you stops. So it's a very kind of physiological sensation where suddenly everything drops. <laughs> so I thought that's what just happened, but I think it was just the AC. Anyway, all right. Um, so example 24. Um, I guess... Okay, so um, we call them funnel ants, which are two n minus one. Um, And um, I guess what I expect from this operation is basically actually using the same mask. So it's kind of convenient because if you do this shift of the double width thing, and then sh uh, and this keep in mind this is still the low mask, this will actually give the right result. Well, that's assuming it's a right shift, I suppose. I guess it always is. With a funnel shifter, there's no real orientation, really. It's really just a slicer. I think that's a better way to think about it, um, which corresponds to this operation. Okay, that doesn't work. So 0, and obviously this should be 0, but it's claiming. Okay. Okay, so that works. Um, so th that's just a test of the basic funnel shifter that it does that kind of uh, bit slicing that you expect it to. <clears throat> um, okay, so now, like I said, the idea is kind of almost the opposite of a of a of a barrel of a rotation based unit where we did with barrel shifting. Uh, most of the work is going to be on preparing the right source, the right double width minus one source, so that when we do this operation, we will pick out the right bits. So um, let's see here. Um, so let me say left. Uh, let's do a right funnel shifter first. It's probably the, the natural orientation. So I'm going to have to figure this along the way because I know the idea, but I haven't thought through ever uh, the right formulas. But it seems like it shouldn't be too bad. Like, for example, for a right funnel shifter, you just make the upper bits be zero, basically. So um, you do a funnel shifter. Um, no, actually, that's a left shifter. If I... If, if I funnel shift by w 1, I'm going to skip the lowest bit of the operand. So that's a right shift. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to concatenate a bunch of zeros. And um, I guess two length... Uh, length n minus 1, and it's going to be zeros. So let's try that.
Oh, right. In this case, we want to go back to a normal with input. Since now we're kind of configuring it, we have our own source generation. So now um, this example, um, we're going to go back to normal uints and example 25. And we want to basically, it's the same thing, but now it has kind of a different implied meaning because there's no high bits to start with. OK, so that works. Um, let's do left shifter logical. Um, to do left shifter logical, I guess you have to complement. Like, I think in this case, I'm going to cap them in the reverse order. But I'm going to use a negated um, shift amount so that suppose I want to actually left shift by 1. I'm going to funnel shift by 31 um, which I think is going to work out just kind of visualizing the array the way I see it in my brain. So let me just try with minus 1. And I guess you can do the pre-shifting there too, or but let's just try the straightforward thing. Um, so that's twenty-six. Oh right, yeah. So you can do something similar to the pre-shift, where the the bits you're filling into the source are dependent. Uh, in a similar way to the way the pre-shifter work. Let me just try this though, and then I'll I'll do that little optimization. Where was that? Uh... Okay. So this is the left shift. Okay, that doesn't work. X is one. Um, was it X and so that should be two. Oh no, we're sorry. I thought it was one one. So that should be one, and we're getting eight. Um, Uh, was it funnel, left shifter? We are getting eight. Okay, yeah, because it's already, okay. So keep in mind that this, I see, so, so this is equal to this uh, minus one. And so it was an off by one, but it turns out that you can then do that. Very nice. Um, so that's the funnel left shifter. And now if you want to do arithmetic shifts, um, I think all you have to do is you have to push this into the high bits, or I guess the low bits, if you want to think of it that way. Now we need to use. Wait, was the original? Why is it? Why do I say left shifter? I'm mixing up my. The right shifter is there, so this is the arithmetic right shifter. And so it's the same thing, but sign bit replicated uh,
Example 26 is what? Oh. This is minus 8. Uh, Is that true? Wait, what's n? I thought n was... So minus 8 is... Small, the smallest possible unassigned. Um, okay, why is so? It says it's saying that y is six. Let me just go and look at see if I did something stupid. Um. All I did was take the right shifter and replace the bits with sign bits. Given that these are what appear where the original source bits don't, I'm not sure why. Um, We verified example, this is the original red shifter, logical red shifter. Here we're using signed ints. Um, we're using the right module for the test. This is an overflow fit now. If I do an arithmetic redshift, this should be, no, uh, right. So if I do an arithmetic redshift, this should be this. Which is four, minus four. Uh, and I'm getting getting an extra bit. I'm getting something shifted in. I mean, this could also, could also be random because of the specific test pattern, I suppose. Funnel arithmetic right shifter. So 27. And this should be a single bit. Can't remember. It's possible this function doesn't work the way I expect it to, and I have to use rep. Okay, that was the bug. So I was just using a type conversion function in a way that where I misunderstood the meaning. Oh yeah, I know. It's because it's going to zero extend it in that case. So that, that's just my bad. Because this is a type and I'm just treating it as a one bit thing and it's going to zero extend it when you ask for that type conversion. So I have to do this explicit replication uh, to the high bits. Okay, so that was just a stupid little thing. So so, so my, I was thinking the right thing but writing the wrong thing. Um, All right, so what is Fabian saying about the rotation? Um, I 
Okay, actually, b before we do that, let's. Um... No, it's fine. I, I guess that is the next step. So, yeah, funnel, right rotate. Uh, you basically just replicate the bits. Uh, except for, I guess, the last bit, which there's no room for. And so this is uh, 28, and this is rot r x n, which is already comes masked on the output. Uh, uh, takes. All right, we have to concatenate it. Okay. Minus, oh, this should not be unsigned. Okay, that works. Um, and for the left rotator, um, I guess basically the same thing in reverse. Uh, and then with the negation, so there's, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, just looking at how the symmetries are uh, are coming off. Um, and then, okay, that was maybe too, too cavalier. Uh, Rote L, XN is 8, and we're getting 9. Oh, you're right, I, I, sli I sliced off the ro right, wrong bit. Funnel, left rotator. Um, okay, yay. So those are all the different cases. Um, and then we called funnel shifter unit. <sighs> and so I guess we're going to do something simple or something similar. Uh, we have a direction. We have a, it, we basically have, let's say we have the same set of control bits that we had before. Um, and we can see that whatever we do, we always end up with a funnel shifter at the end. Uh, you can see that here. There's no output mux. It's all on the input side. Um, and so let's see. Um, the first is direction. Um, basically, I think it's like this. And maybe it has the reverse sense of what is the positive direction, but that's easy to handle. Um, um, and then for the input bits, I guess you can be, well, if you just want to kind of write it directly, It's much cleaner in slice notation than if you have to do the bitwise analysis because then you have to figure out is the index before or after the cutoff point or something like that. So maybe I'll just write it as a bit vector mux and not be overly specific about how that distributes out to the individual bits. Um, let me think here. So if you're doing a right shifter, Um, you probably want to cut the slices into three pieces. That way each of the pieces needs fewer options instead of having a full big full width mux. Oh, I see what you mean. 
Um, it's also possible I'll just stop now since I've been going two and a half hours, and I kind of feel like uh, that that last piece is important, and I'll do it tomorrow because I'm going to do rather than doing on Wednesday, I'm going to do another one tomorrow. Uh, we already covered all the cases, and so um, then I'll leave the sort of the fiddly bits of combining them efficiently to tomorrow. But you, you've seen what I think is the basic insight about how the basic funnel shifting. Uh, operation can be used to synthesize these individual ones. And then it's really a matter of sort of fiddling to figure out this, the, the efficient combination. Uh, so let's leave that for tomorrow and say that's a good good stopping point for today. Um, but actually, let me answer questions. Yeah, I know. I've known Ju Julia for a very long time. It doesn't really do any, it doesn't do anything that I, I mean, like it, it doesn't, of, of the various areas where I, uh, have need for languages. It doesn't fill any of the spots, basically. Um, but it's a cool language. All right, uh, that's going to be it for today. Uh, I hope that was interesting. Th that this is, I mean, semi-hardcore stuff. I think like most people don't know this. I think even most people who read about this in textbooks don't necessarily understand the details. We've now implemented and tested something, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, Let's see how, actually, let's run a timing analysis on it just before we finish. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's look at the final. Um, um, what was the one with the barrel shifter, the all singing, all dancing barrel shifter? That was 23. Oh. Um, Probably there's a few other. This delay model is complete shit. Um, this should also be more like logarithm. This is not quite the same meaning. What did I set that to? 10. I don't know. Uh, what's the other bit that we need to do? Okay, let's just... The, 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 yeah, this is going to be really inaccurate. Um, but the fact that it's hidden in the mask generation, even if it's counted a really unrealistic cost, maybe it's okay. Um, because this is the stuff that I was kind of expressing. All right, let's just pretend this is reasonable. Uh, so wise, uh, wise worst case delay is the worst case over this. So it looks like it's 14 to N, um, which goes through all the muxes. I don't print the critical path, so I don't know where this goes uh, exactly. But uh, well, we know it goes at least through the output mux and then potentially through the other one. But I don't think it's going to be the mass generation. So anyway, um, if you recall, our one of our adders, uh, one of our parallel prefix log depth adders was like 23. But like these numbers are not necessarily. Um, I haven't even tried very hard like i literally got these numbers up and running this morning so i'm going to tune the the cost model to ha at least have some resemblance to textbook logical effort but i need to do fan out and other things like that before i uh i can do it so anyway um yeah let's just call it a day uh, i'll be back tomorrow to continue this stuff and maybe cover multipliers and some other arithmetic things um but uh, after that, I will be traveling, and I will try to get back on a regular schedule when I get to Denmark, but it will probably be on European hours, because I will be in Europe for at least a month. So anyway, thanks for coming by. I uh, hope this was interesting, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.